Thank you for being here today. In this talk, I will, I will speak about magnetic filaments. I will give a, a brief overview about our, our research on this, on this field of magnetic filaments. And the work has been done in collaboration with people from the University of, Vien of Vienna, like Pedro Sánchez and Sofia Kantorovic, and also people from the Ural Federal University in Ekaterinburg, uh, Pianzina, Ekaterina Pianzina and Ekaterina Novak. Uh, of course, also people from here, Daniel, that maybe you remember, he was with us for a year, and Thomas Simons. Okay, so this is the outline, more or less, of what will be the talk. First, I will give you an introduction about what are magnetic filaments and what are they useful for. And then I will explain you how we model the magnetic filaments in our numerical simulations, in our studies. And then I will provide you with... Uh, for examples of our research. Let's start from the, from the beginning. What is a magnetic filament? Well, as you can see here, a magnetic filament is basically a string of colloids, of colloidal particles, that are magnetic. And they are held together either by some link between the particles or by some kind of constraint, as we will see later. What is the advantage of magnetic filaments with respect to chemical polymer? Well, the basic advantage is that you can have a strong magnetization and that, this, and that the magnetic <coughs> properties of the filaments can be, uh, can be retained at room temperature or even above of that temperature. While in the case of chemical polymers, what happens is that usually for 1D chemical polymers, uh, the magnetization just holds till 100 Kelvin, more or less. So, our aim is basically to study the properties of these filaments and try, and try to see if they can be used in some kind of uh, prospective applications, as, we will have, as I will show you later. So our story about magnetic filaments starts here, in the era of dinosaurs, especially in the period of the Cretaceous, here in the mud, where, some, uh, where a type of bacteria started to develop uh, the what are the magnetic filaments. So you, as you can see, there is a family of bacteria. There are some of them that have just four colloidal par magnetic colloidal particles, while others have many of them. And they use them to orientate inside, in, inside the mud, so they can know where is the surface, so it's kind of orientation system. Well, as you can see, magnetic filaments have been in the Earth much longer than humans. And for humans, it took quite longer to realize that they could, they could build up these kind of filaments. And there are many methods right now. And they started around the beginnings of the century to do them. And when, for instance, for big colors, what you can do is use biotinated DNA that you join to the particles that have attached to the, to the surface some extractivity uh, links. Mm. This is one way of doing the thing. So you, what you do is you align the particles first with a magnetic field, and then you add the DNA protonated chains, and then the reaction stays, takes place. Mm. Then you can suppress the magnetic field, and the filaments stay there. Mm. Already good forever. Another way of doing, of creating magnetic filaments is relying that in some cases, like for instance the polystyrene cobalt, or uh, well, the cobalt particles created with polystyrene, uh, this interaction is so strong, the magnetic interaction is so strong that they can hold, they can be, they can hold together even in absence of a field without any need of, a, of linking them. Mm -hmm. So first what you do is you apply a magnetic field, 
they orientate, they form the chains, and then just you suppress the momentum field as easy as that in this case. Another way, more complex, can be, for instance, to use particles created with a polymer, which then reacts with a copolymer that has to pass one that uh, likes the, the, the first polymer, and the second one that, here in green, that is able to react with light and then make cross linkings so you get a filament that, well, let's say kind of a pot that uh, contains the, the magnetic particles, so you have also in this way a filament created. With this technique, for instance, you can create this kind of filaments, <coughs> you can see that, well, I don't know if you can see from there, the dark will be the, the magnetic cores and the gray will be the, the polymer layer surrounding the magnetic cores. There are many methods, but one, for instance, that caught my attention was this one, in where you directly create the magnetic particles on top of the, molecule, of the DNA basis. That's another way also to do it. And well, in all the cases, well, we are interested in what are ferromagnetic colors, so that they have a permanent magnetization even in the absence of, a magnetic, of an external magnetic field. But for that, it's necessary that this, well, of course, must be a suitable material, but also the size of the particles is important. Because if the particles are too big, what happens is that they are polydomains, so magnetic polydomains. Mm -hmm. So there are more than one, let's say in this way, magnetic dipole, so the sum up of all them is just zero. So you don't have a permanent magnetization in absence of a field. And if the size is too small, what happens is that you have a monodomain, but what happens is that the wall, the block walls are not big enough, so the, the dipole is not fixed in the crystal structure of the particle. So the, the dipole is rotating inside the crystal structure. So also, in average, you have a zero dipole, zero magnetization. So, here, when we measure the coercitivity, that is the field you need to reduce to zero the, the magnetization of the particle, in front of the size, this is just a sketch, depends on the material, the, the range of, of, this, of sizes, but well, more or less orientatively, you can see that only in a, in a range between 10 and 100 nanometers, more or less, you will have what we call permanent dipoles, or permanent magnetic particles, in absence of a field. So what is the, what they are useful for these magnetic filaments? Well, for instance, they could be used as improved ferrofluids. So as you know, ferrofluids uh, have main, most of the properties of the ferrofluids are due to the ability they have to form chains. So well, here you have already the chains formed, so that could be useful for that. Also as nano swimmers, this has already, already been tested. Also as sensors, or for magnetic storage, water mass and diffraction grids. Also, for instance, if you attach many of them to a surface, what you could get is what is called a magnetic brush. And these magnetic brushes you could use, for instance, inside an ion channel to as valves or selective size filters for doing, for instance, for performing nanochromo tunable nanochromatography. Also, you could use them as nanoactuators, so you could push one of these uh, second surface, a little bit, few nanometers up and down, or also to control the rheological properties of the, of, of the surface. So depending on if the, they are retracted or expanded, so the surface will have different kind of magnetic, pro different kind of rheological properties. Also, you could use them with an alternating magnetic field as a pump to pump small particles. So this is more or less the introduction. So now I will explain you how, in our studies, we model the, the magnetic filaments. For, for before that, I would like to locate you a little bit. We are working in what is called, is known as condensed matter. And inside the condensed matter, we are in what we call somehow the realm of the soft matter. Uh, and in this, we work in the area of colloids and polymers, more or less in this area. So a thing that is common to all numerical simulation to all simulations working in this field, most of it, of the other part, is that there are two main problems. 
The first one is that the, the system, the colloidal particles, are inside the soul. And if we want to put, um, for us it's impossible, and we will see, to put all the, pa all the solvent particles in, in, in the system, so simulate all the particles. Why? Well, you could say, well, I take a computer big enough, and that would be enough for doing it. But as you can see, even with the most, with the best supercomputer at the moment, so the Taiyang 2 in China, that can operate to 10 to the 16 flops, one could build a table of how long it will take to deal with 3 milliliters of water, that is a little bit more than what is in this Eppendorf here. And what well, it contains basically about 10 to the 23 atoms. So let's suppose, if you suppose that uh, you have one flow per, per atom, this will take you about two weeks to complete, to complete uh, one, uh, one time step in this simulation. And if you wanted to do the same uh, in just one second, to have something reasonable for a numerical simulation, Assuming that Moore's law will hold indefinite, indefinitely, you will need about 31, you need to wait for 31 years till the new supercomputer appears. If you do something more reasonable, like for instance, assuming that for each flop, for each atom, you need about as many flops as atoms that are in the system, then, or particles that are in the system, then you will reach this astounding amount of 10 to the 21 years. And you want to wait for having a supercomputer able to do that in one second, more or less you will need about 150 years. So somehow somebody could think, well, we are hopeless about this problem. The more, there is a second problem, is that we cannot average over all possible cases. I mean, if we have a filament, just let's suppose three colloidal particles, what could do something like that? I mean, you put it in a two-dimensional grid, and you assume, and you, if you want to compute the distance between the two ends of the colloid, of the, excuse me, of the filament, well, just you do all the you just create all the possibilities, and you just measure for each one which is the distance between the two ends, and that's it. You create, you, are, you average over the 36 possible conformations, and you get the problem, the average value. But in the case you have a chain a little bit longer, just 100 monomers, and in a three-dimensional bit, the number of conformations rises to 10 to the 15 conformations. And just to give you a rough idea of what that means, is that if we suppose that for creating one of these conformations you need 100 flops, and assuming the best computers to be of the order of 10 to 16 flops, that will mean that you will need of the order of 10 to 28 years. To get a little bit the scale of what is that, compared to the uh, age of the Earth and the universe that are of the order of 10 to the 9. So uh, it seems like the song says you know, that maybe in the year 2525. Uh, but by fortune, there are methods that allow us to skip this thing of having to put all the particles of solvent in the system. And also, it's possible to prove that you don't need to create to address over all possibilities, just what you need is a sample, a reasonable sample of the system. Uh, let's say a reasonable subset of conformations that make a representative uh, sample of the system. So there are several methods, but the one we use here is the Langevin dynamics. In the Langevin dynamics, what we do basically is we use the the Newton equations, and one can prove that with the Newton equations, if you allow the particles to evolve according to the Newton equations, you can, waiting a little bit, uh, get a representative set of conformations of the system that you can average and get a good idea of what is happening in your, in your system or characterize the system. So, how we do with the problem of the solvent? Well, with the problem of the solvent, what we do is we replace the molecules of solvent by the main effects they have onto the big particles. So we have to be aware that the colloidal particles are like this building and the molecules are of water are very small. So how we could do that? Well, basically, in a first approach, in a very coarse approach, what does a fluid is? A 
friction over the particles that move inside the, inside the, inside the fluid. And this we can represent through a typical term proportional to the velocity. And also, we have the Brownian motion that is due to the kicks that the small particles exert on the big colloidal particles. And this we can approach using a white Gaussian noise. So with this, we can create a set equal to three times the number of particles we have uh, of, equ of equations. And we have to solve it. Usually what we do is, uh, in our case, is we use the software package expression, which several of us has contributed to create it or to develop it. And well, the first thing we need is to model the, the magnetic cores that usually they are surrounded by a surfactant layer to avoid or to prevent the, the coagulation of them due to the van der Waals forces. And what we do is, we use a kind of Lennard shifted and truncated uh, potential. And the truncation is done at the minimum, so in such a way that you have a shape like this for the potential, what is called a soft potential, a soft core, and goes smoothly to zero. And we don't use a hard wall, but we use this kind of potential. A site of order, in addition to the, the hard walls, give some troubles in using Langevin dynamics and molecular dynamics simulation. Also, because in this way, also we mimic the, the soft layer of, surf, of, sur, of surfactant surrounding the, 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 the magnetic cores. In addition to this potential, well, I have to say that from now on, if when I refer to filaments made of these particles with just this interaction, I will call them non-sticky non particles, non-sticky filaments. Okay, when there is just this kind of interaction. But then also what happens is that in many cases, either due to the uh, attraction towards other interactions between the colloids, or due to the fact that they don't, the, the, what we call the quality of the solvent, so sometimes particles don't, don't like to stay in, certain, in a certain solvent, so they try to minimize the, the, surfa the total surface that they offer to the solvent. Mm -hmm. So, and they attract, and there is kind of an attractive interaction between them. Uh, so, in this case, what we do to model this kind of attraction is to add a second potential, an attractive part, that is again a truncated shift of Leonard Jones, with, but with a larger uh, cutoff, in such a way that now the, to the, whole poten the total potential has a shallow well, uh, shallow attractive well. Also, there is the problem of how we deal with the magnetic interaction. If you take the the Maxwell equations for a, for a magnetic particle in a certain medium, you can see that, after several lines of algebra, that this amounts to have more or less the effects represented by a dipole located at the center of the particle. And when we have more than one particle, if the, if the concentration is not too high, then we can reasonably assume that the, we can, the, the particles will interact as two dipoles located at the center of those particles. And the expression for this interaction is here, where the main trend of it is that it's proportional to the, to the mo dipolar moment of both dipoles and inversely proportional to the cube of the distance between them, between the centers. Here I would like to define, because we will use latest tensibly, is the parameter eta. That is a non-dimensional parameter that relates the strength of the isotropic attraction between colloids to the magnetic interaction. In the case that the, well, the particles are in the most optimal position and orientation. That is called nose to tail. So, also we need to mimic the link, well, the connectivity of the chain. So, what we will use is this kind of spin model in which no, you should notice that the spin is between two fixed points of the surface, not between the centers of the, of the, the particles. And this potential can be implemented in our equations through a spring uh, potential modified by this term of here. Hmm? Okay. So once 
we have explained what are magnetic filaments and we have explained uh, how we model them, we can now I will provide you different, four different examples of what we do in our research. So the first thing I will show you is how we deal with uh, a single chain in the bulb, so alone, without anything around. And this represents somehow the limit of a magnetic solution, well, in the limit of, of infinite dilution. Mm -hmm. And in this case, to characterize the chain, what I will do is I will use these three observables. The end-to-end -end distance, that as the name says, is the distance between the two ends of the chain. Then the radius of generation that is computed through the eigenvalues of, the, of this tensor, of the generation tensor, mm -hmm. that is computed through the relative distance between particles, well, relative positions between particles. And then also the specific heat that, as you know, is related to the fluctuations in the energy. So when we measure for instance, the end-to-end -end versus the temperature, what we see immediately is that in all cases, independently of how strong is the interaction between the monomers, the isotropic interaction between monomers, all them uh, get, well, the two end, the distance decays to one that means that the two ends stay together. In the case of the radius of gyration, we can see that as when the, well, when the particles start to interact between them isotropically, we have a decay also of the radius of duration. That means that the chain is collapsing. The collapse occurs at higher temperatures, as higher is the value of eta. And as we can see, the decay is, has kind of two steps or three in some cases, and we will, now we will try to explain that. And also in the case of eta zero, so the non-sticky case, what we see is that initially the chain extends a little bit, then compress, and then extends, extends again. Why this happens can be understood very well in these snapshots. So what we have at high temperatures for non-sticky filaments is that the chain is in an open conformation, and when you reduce the temperature, what occurs is that due to the fluctua thermal fluctuations are each time smaller, the dipoles arrange in a, what is called the nose tail conformation, so one after the other, uh, and this tends to span the chain. But at some point, the chain, some temperature, realizes that for the chain, it's much better to still try to preserve this, this arrangement, but join the two ends. And that let uh, have a, uh, the two ends at close contact, because then you gain an extra interaction, magnetic interaction, and that lets to the formation of these closed structures that evolve as the temperature goes lower to these kind of ideal rings, trying then to, to arrive to the ideal ring conformation. Also, we can see this kind of transition, conformational transition, in the specific heat. If you realize here there is a small bump, here you have a zoom, and as you can see, in, independently of the value of eta, you have the transition at the same point. What means that eta is not a relevant parameter, just that happens is that the when the temperature goes down enough, the, the two ends want to stay together. So it depends on the value of, of mu, of the magnetic moment. But also we can realize in this picture here that there are other transitions that have larger peaks. What means that they have a much larger rearrangement of particles. And if we ask about what are these, in other transitions that shows the specific heat, we can understand it easily here in this picture. So as we reduce the, temp the temperature, uh, open chains transform into closer to structures, kind of let's call them rings, and then the rings make a second transition to what we call a liquidal closed states that you can see better here. Basically, it's a kind of a helix, but the two ends at the end stay together, so they stay at close contact. And this is what minimizes the energy, the free energy of the system at this temperature for these parameters. But there are more than that. You can realize when we increase further the value of eta, so we, we increase the strength of the attraction between the monomers in the chain, that some other peaks start to emerge. 
here in specific heat. And in the case of eta 0, 0, 011 and eta 0, 012, that you cannot see here, when you measure the, the derivative of the radius of gyration, you can see peaks showing that here something else is happening, some other transition is taking place. And also, one can realize the, some small bumps here in the specific heat that arise at very low temperatures, and that implies also a second, uh, another transition, another transition that is taking place in the, in the chains. When we check the conformations, we can see some things like that. So at high temperatures, what happens is that we have partially compact states that basically are a compact core plus two segments that spread away from the core. And then we have also the compact disordered states at very low temperatures that basically is a global where everything has collapsed and is still uh, and is disordered. So we can't disorder a global. So with these things, we can build up a first tentative phase diagram of magnetic filaments in the limit of the infinite dilution. And here we have the value of the strength of the isotropic interaction relative to the magnetic interaction. And here we have the temperature. And as we can see, we have different phases, simple closed or rings, extended open, partially collapsed, liquidly closed, and compact disordered chains. And we can also notice, for instance, in this phase diagram, some interesting things, like, for instance, here and here should be two triple points. And well, this shows us that somehow even a single filament leads to a very complex, quite complex or tricky um, phase diagram. So if now we do, we apply a magnetic field to see what happens to this change when a magnetic field is applied, what we see is that basically, uh, if the field is, is small, for instance, 0.01, well, basically you have the same that happens at zero field, so it's the same behavior. But when you increase the field, for instance, at 0.02, you start to notice that the chain, well, in average, seems to open, so the end to end increases again. So what is happening here is a little bit more complex than just chains opening. In fact, what you get is a kind of be stable. Uh, phase, in which here uh, we can, we can, I can show you. What happens is that at zero field you have a peak, a single peak here, and this, excuse me, this is the probability of having a certain instantaneous value of the radius of generation for the chain. So what we can see here is that at zero field for this temperature, what we have is just uh, closed chains. But as we increase the field, what happens is that it starts to emerge another peak in the distribution. And this peak corresponds to open chains. And the, and the larger is the value of H, of H, larger is the value of the mean value of the radius of generation. So the chains are those that are open span with the field, with increasing field. And we can see, for instance, that at H 0 0.05, the populations of both more or less compared, of open chains and closed chains compared. Why did this happen? For example, you are still in the extreme dilute, so you have only one chain. One chain. This is, this is in time, so you, have, you see the... They are in time, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the other... Time, they yeah, yeah. are opening and, and closing. Exactly. exactly, that's it. Hmm? So what is happening here is that, well, at zero field, the difference in free energy between open chains and closed chains at these temperatures, at very low temperatures, is very big. So the, if there was a kind of state of some kind of chemical equilibrium between conformations, no? what you will have is that is completely biased towards the formation of closed chains. But when a field is applied, what happens is that the two levels, uh, well, the two, uh, the, two the two conformations level their free energy to the point that this has to be a real equilibrium between them in the sense that when you have just one sing single one in your system, it's fluctuating from one conformation to the other. And you can see many of these, of these changes over the course of the simulation. Now we can ask if this was for non-sticky filaments, the most simple case, what happens in the case of, of a sticky filaments? So, well, first here, then, excuse me. Now here you can see 
in the HT diagram how we have three different phases. So we have closed chains at very low temperatures and low fields. Then we have the region of the open chains. And then what was just a very narrow uh, space of, of be stable between the two phases at zero field, now here is a huge area, huge zone, region of the, of the phase diagram that becomes a B stable. So you have both at the same time. Hmm? Well, you pass from one to the other. Hmm? So this also implies that when you have more than one chain, what you will expect is that this region of here, that is the fluctuation zone, will convert into a kind of coexistence phase hmm? between both of them, between the, the two types. When we have Stockmeyer filaments, or sticky filaments, that have monomers that are attracted between them, in this case, we can see also something very interesting that is that both the end-to-end, -end, the radius of duration, and also the probability of having open structures show a very weird behavior. So first they decay, then they go up, then they, there is kind of a plateau, and then suddenly they drop down. Hmm? And why this happens, and this notice also please that depends on the strength of the field. So at very low values of the field, the mo the the behavior is very monotonous, it's became very monotonously. And this all this happens when the fields are kind of medium, uh, 0 0.02, 0 0.05. So what is happening here is again that first you, you can see here uh, the probability of having a certain radius of duration as a function of the values of theta, what you can see is that at the, very, at the beginning, what is happening is that the probability of having rings and ch open chains is the same, but when you start to increase the attraction between the monomers, as you will expect, what happens is that they, the, the, the closed chains, the rings, starts to increase the, the population at the expenses of the open chains, but then it turns out that the open chains uh, excuse me, that the rings uh, get unstable mm, because they are close to the transition to a helicoidal state. And in the, at this point, what is happening is that again goes down, mm, again goes, um, so again level the, 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 the free energies of both the states, open and rings, and then you can see how around 0 0.04 again you have again kind of the same population. And a little bit, if you increase a little bit, more the interaction between the between the between the colloids. What happens is that appears a third peak, and this peak is related to the existence of helicoidal states. So at some moment you have a, a three a multiple uh, a multiple state in which you have open rings and helicoidal states at the same time. If you go increasing a little bit more the strength of between the colors, what you see is that open chains uh, remain there, more or less the population is the same all the time, and what happens is that the rings convert into a helices, into helicoidal states. Then if you keep further increasing the value of the attraction between the monomers, you could see that there is again another coexistence equilibrium, but now with this, in this case with the with the compact state. So as you can see, the phase diagram, in the, when you apply a magnetic field to, of a single chain, it becomes even much more tricky than was just that zero field. And also another thing, message to take home, is that the introduction of a field, of a moderate field, allows us to tune quite easily the properties of a, of a chain, of a magnetic filament, using other external parameters. For instance, as you can realize here, the number of open structures can be modified very easily just by changing the value of eta. That means changing the values of the, of the, of the well, changing the quality of the solvent, for instance. And so, in very, with very small amount, uh, variation of the parameter eta, the quality of the solvent, you can have very, <coughs> a, po a larger population or a lower popu uh, a larger population or a lower population of open structures and that can for instance modify the properties of the solution like the magnetization and this and, this, and the rheology of, the, of these fluids um, and now I will present you another case that is 
what happens when we have a filament in a flow. In this case, we will use, because we want to capture the hydrodynamic interactions in a reasonable way, we will use an, an hybrid scheme of simulation. We will use molecular dynamics for our filaments that will be of a length more or less of 30. And for the solvent, we will use what is called multiparticle collision dynamics. In this case, what we do is we assume that we have well, uh, point-like particles that somehow represent bunches of bunches of solvent particles. And we have about three millions of these point-like particles. And what we do is just we put a slit, the filament in a slit, and we put also the other particles. We load the slit with this particle, these three million of particles, and we push the particles with a force in order to get either a Poisson flow or a shear flow for these particles, and we study what happens to the magnetic field hmm? in this case. Also, we can apply a magnetic field in the direction perpendicular to the slit. Okay, so what happens is that, for instance, <coughs> at zero field, we see that there is what we call a coil stretching transition. So due to the difference in velocity in both profiles, we observe that uh, the chain first stretches and then coils back. And this is a process that goes over all the whole length of the simulation. Here, when you, a way to characterize this coil stretching is through the use of the magnetization along the, of the chain along the x axis, that is the one of the direction of the flow. And we normalize just by the saturation magnetization, so the maximum magnetization can have the field. And as you can see, the blue lines correspond to the zero field. It goes up and down around zero mm. This is the same for Poisson and for the uni uniform shear. When you introduce a field, what happens is that you can tune the frequency of these drops. And if the, and if the field is large enough, what happens is that, for instance, in the uniform shear, it gets blocked. So the, the magnetization gets blocked to a certain value. While in the case of the Poisson, you see that is blocked, then there is a sudden drop to the same value, but the reverse value of the magnetization, and then another and another. Uh, it is this kind of jumps. What is happening here, basically, is that there are two contributions to the orientation of the chain. What, one is the, the magnetic torque, that what tends to do is to orientate the, the filament along the field axis, or the exact axis. And the other is the hydrodynamic torque that tries to, due to difference in velocity, to put the, to lay the particle ar along the direction of the flow. And of course, the hydrodynamic torque high is higher when the when the particle is in this position and is zero when it's just along the flow. So that means that the field somehow well, and there is a point where the both torques compensate. And you can have the chain in a blocked conformation, like well, in the case of the Poisson flow, will be four different conformations are possible. While in the case of the excuse, in the case of the uniform shear, there is just two of them. And well, we can see, for instance, that when we increase the the backlight number, so it's, this is the the speed, let's call in the way of the flow we see that the angle decays. And in the case we increase the value of the field, the angle, the alignment of the angle in respect to the flow increases. So somehow we, here we have shown that in this, in this systems we have two things. One is that uh, well, we have uh, this stretching coil transition. And that then with an external field, we can modulate, or we can tune this transition, the frequency of this when it's happening, or even block the transition and get the particles in a single orientation, so get the filaments always in a permanent orientation. This can have implications, for instance, in the magnetic, in the magnetic properties of the fluid, or also, for instance, in the magnetic properties, but also in the rheology of the fluid, depending on how these particles are orientated. And this you can get it with small fields, so that's kind of interesting for, for industrial applications. And the last system, I will explain, or the last example I will explain to you, is the magnetic brush. 
In the case of the magnetic brush, what we have is basically this surface, and we have anchored to the surface many of, the, of these filaments. And we have, uh, in order to avoid the finite size effects, we have replicated the cell over all directions in the plane. And due to that, because we use this replication, these periodic boundary conditions, we have to use some kind of sophisticated methods to take into account the, the dipolar interaction because it's of low range. And well, what we do, what we realize, for instance, the first thing we can realize is that the, the, the density profile of monomers, this is the surface, zero is the, represent the surface, is that they don't follow the parabolic profile found in non-magnetic fields. So the non-magnetic will be the white, the magnetic are the red, but they have much compressed, compressed uh, profiles, and in fact, they do not obey the, the parabolic law, but the DGN's carpet, self-similar carpet profile, what is usually found in the case of chains that disturb one to the other, in the case of, uh, of absorbing surfaces for polymers. Another thing we can realize, or we can already get from here, an image we can get is that somehow the magnetic interactions are going against the entropic interactions because entropy tends to spread the, the change out of the, of the surface in order to get the maximum possible amount of conformations. And as you can see, in the case of magnetic filaments, what we get is a much more com compressed uh, brush. But one could think, well, in view of, what, of all what we have seen, basically what happens here maybe is that you, the chains do some kind of transition by themselves, and they close, and that makes the, the system to, to compress. But when we see the probability of having a certain value of the end-to-end -end distance, we see that the, the number of close conformations is not very large, in the, the difference between uh, non-magnetic and magnetic. And the profiles are more or less kind of similar, so that's not the reason. Also, what have, you can see, as is another effect you can see, is that appears when you, you see the, the probability of having a certain uh, instantaneous uh, average height of the brush. You can see that in the case of magnetic filaments yeah, at, ha, at large uh, anchoring uh, densities of, part of chains, you can see that emerges a second peak and the distributions are different. So how we can fit all this together? So also, for instance, we can see that with temperature, something weird happens. A high temperature, of course, what one would expect, that is that, well, the higher is the density, higher is the mean value of the high of the polymer. But at low temperatures, that's not the case. Both are the same, so it doesn't depend on the density of the gravity density. And well, to explain this, or try to explain this, we have resort here to the connectivity, well, to the tools of the network analysis. Here, what happens is that we realize that the response of the brush is due to the interactions between the particle, between the monomers, one to one. And then what we do is we try to see what type of clusters are created here inside these brushes. And we do, what, we do, what we do is we define a distance criterion, and the distance criterion basically is, well, a distance large enough as all the particles inside the same chain will be considered from the set, for the set, will be considered to be of the same cluster. And with this, well, then you can compute the agency, agency matrix, and we can then plot the graph of the clusters we get, and also we can use some some observables like, for instance, the, the between the centrality and the uh, average number of vertices and these things. Mm -hmm. And well, here, for instance, we have we can see already just by plotting the graphs of the clusters we get that the, there is a huge difference between non-magnetic and magnetic brushes. And well, here, the, so the, the graphs have been plotted in such a way that they fit more or less fine inside the board, so do not, there is not a special correlation between this and this. Uh, the only is the color, so the yellow corresponds to the, to the yellow, the orange corresponds to the orange, uh, in this way. Uh. So what we can see is that 
in the case of non-magnetic brushes, the, the, the grass we obtain are much branched than in the case of uh, magnetic brushes. So somehow the, the magnetic interaction is preventing this branching of the clusters. Mm -hmm. And also we observe the appearance of uh, cir well, circular, of course, or loops uh, graphs. What we realize when we change the temperature using this kind of representation is that we evolve from this at high temperature towards these states where they are more linear, the graphs, and also we have linear and uh, loops, and we end up in this kind of structures, of peak structures, that basically represent loops of part of the, so they mean, that means that the clusters make loops in order to try to minimize the, the magnetic flux that is in the system at very low temperatures. If we go at higher densities, we can see that uh, all the particles start to participate in these clusters. Mm, and that, well, in this case, uh, the behavior is much more complex with multiple loops. Mm, and so how well, we, can, we can try to measure what is the importance of the, so one question we ask ourselves is, well, how the different monomers of the chain uh, are active on this, on, on the, how they participate in this cluster. So for instance, are the, just the, the, mo the free ends of the monomers, so the ones at the top of the brush, those that create the clusters, or somehow are the top with the bottom, so with the graph that which are doing the clusters, so they're the responsible for the clusters. So in order to try to, to answer to these questions, we have measured the betweenness centrality that I guess many of you know it is just you, what you have is when you have two, let's say, two nodes, two, 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 two vertices of the cluster, let's call U and VW. What you do is you measure the number of paths that go of the minimum, let's say, of geodesics that go from this to this other one, passing through another vertice that is you call D. Uh, and you did this, this, this simple calculation. Uh, and for instance, in this case, for instance, we could measure what would be the between, uh, how many paths pass between two and four around the, the three, the minimal paths. Uh, and you could get the betweenness that would be this case two. Uh, and somehow, as you know, many of you know, the indicators of centrality help us to identify the important vertices in the network. And here, for instance, we have measured, we have represent the, the centrality, be, the, the, the between the centrality for two different densities mm, as a function of the monomer we have. So you should write in this way, or in this way. Yeah? And the first thing we can, we can realize is that at high, den well, at high densities, the centrality is larger, and more or less, the, central the centrality is the same for all monomers, so that means that all monomers participate more or less in the same way in the formation of clusters, but when you increase the temperature, what happens is that, for instance, the grafted ends do no longer participate in the, or participate at a less extent, in, the, in, the, in these clusters that are appearing in the, in the system. And <coughs> also we can see, we can, when we measure the, the size of the clusters, we can see the temperature, we can see that there is a minimum here, and that corresponds to the formation, the larger amount of formation of chains, and this is due somehow to the following. When you have very low temperatures, the system tries to get multiple loops and try to, to close the, the loops in such a way that you minimize the magnetic flux. But of course, the when you increase the temperature, the, tem the, the fluctuation what do is they break these clusters, and for that the size of the clusters goes down. But then at some point, if you increase further the temperature, what happens is that the temperature is promoting the appearance of random contacts between the different chains. And this is why, again, the, the, size, the size of the clusters starts to rise again. And if you measure, for instance, when you apply a magnetic field, what you can realize is that the grafting density has a strong influence on the response of the brush to the external field. As you can see here, the mean height, when you measure with respect to the value of H of the field, you can see that 
the, when the density is lower, the reaction to the film is much sooner than in the case of a much denser, of a much denser brush. Hmm? We can also see that by increasing the, the height of the brush, what you do is you, increase, you get kind of a step profile in the, in the density of monomers. So somehow what we see here is that with an external field, we could easily tune uh, the properties of, a, of an external, excuse me, of a, of a low dense uh, brush, but when the brushes are increase their density, it becomes more difficult to be able to control the properties of it. Or we have to resort to larger fields to do that. Also, what we can see through the graph analysis is that when you increase the, the value of the external field, the type of clusters you get change, and in the limit of high, of high, of high fields, what you get basically is that there are two types of branched structures compatible with the field. Well, some of them are the X-type junctions, as you can see here. That means chains, well, chains that are basically joined, two chains that are together in the same class of due to the interaction between, central, between two central monomers. Mm -hmm. And also we can have another type of less common, but also appears, that are half interlaced chains. As the cluster, we have, as the graph we have here, what happens is that half of the chain is interacting all with all, and that is due to the kind of twist of the two chains. And then the upper sides of the chain are just open, so just go away. So this also we can easily realize through this graph analysis that this is occurring. So, as a conclusion, we have seen that magnetic filaments. Well, is an emerging field and may have many potential applications, and that the behavior of these magnetic filaments and magnetic brushes is very different from the usual polymer chains and polymer brushes, and that, well, still we need to study many things about this system, so it's plenty of room for new studies and advances in this field. So finally, we we'll just thank to the collaborators from Vienna, Sofia, Katerina, and Elena, and Pedro, and also to Daniel and Thomas for the collaboration. Thank you. Uh, now it's time for questions. Yes, mm -hmm. another. Can you repeat how you model in the case with flow? How you model this? Yeah, of course. Did you say you add some collisions? Yeah, we add uh, just a second. Here. So it's no longer larger in dynamics. No, so it's a hybrid. Oh, okay. So basically, what you do is you have your you have two different things. So you have your fluid particles. Well, they're not fluid particles, they are kind of these, you want to represent bunches of fluid particles that are these point-like particles, these three millions of particles. And then you have your chain that is made of big colloidal particles. Yeah? Your chain is usually 30. So what you do is the following. You, and there is a, there is a force pushing the, the, the fluid particles yeah? in order to get this kind of shear velocity or this kind of Poisson profile. And what you do is you just they consist on two steps. The first one is uh, a streaming, it's called, and it consists basically in a ballistic motion. So what you do is they have a velocity, you allow them to go for a certain amount of time with that velocity and see where they go. And then there is the collision step that's a little bit more complex. And what you do is basically you have your particles with certain velocities, your fluid particles, <coughs> and what you do then is you take you make boxes, but they have to be well. It's okay, it's a little bit complicated. This, this boxing you have to do it uh, randomly to avoid to, to preserve the, the Galilean invariance. And then what you do inside this box is you take all the particles and you rotate the velocity of these particles by a certain angle alpha that is also random. Mm -hmm. 
that somehow will mimic that inside that box. Particles have, co have collided between them, many of them, many collisions, and then they go away in certain directions. Hmm? So somehow you have, and you can prove that by doing it in this way, you preserve the hydrodynamic interaction, that is what we are interested in, so you preserve the momentum, and you can more or less have a good representation of what happens when you have. Uh, so the, 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 thing, the main point is that when you have two big particles together, uh, there is this kind of lubrication forces, and the fact that the one passes drags the other in that direction, and here we think that was needed to, to add this to the model. And then what you do is, with these particles, you, uh, let's say, uh, what you do is you pass this information of the velocities of these particles to the big ones in order to know how they will be pushed. Mm -hmm. well, I was thinking that the, the simplest solution is just use the Langevin equation but with the noise not centered in zero, but in No, well, there, is, there, there are other approaches. You could use, for instance, the Osim tensor. So, you could use Langevin dynamics plus the Osim tensor, but what happens, here could be have, could have been used. What happens is that it escapes with n cube, and in the best cases, when n to the 2.5, to 25 with the number of big particles you have. Here we have just 30 particles, the still is in the limit between 10, well, between 1 and 250 seats more or less is still. But what we did already in this way because what we are planning is not just to simulate just one single particle, just single filament, but many filaments. So, and then the we. The reflection of the flow from one filament affects the other filament. Exactly. Well, also inside the same chain is affecting one to the other. And also what happens is that when we scale, escalate the system to n filaments, the n cube goes increasing to so 30, but you have now, let's say, 100 change, 100, so 100 to the cube, that's a lot of time, so you have to be, to do very huge matrices, and so for that we were implementing this system here. You mentioned in this case that uh, there is a oscillatory behavior of mm -hmm. the stretching and compressing si. of the yes. chain. Is this, has this been studied? It's a, it's a replication of the elongated state? Or what is this oscillation coming from? Well, this oscillation is coming from the fact that, well, in the case of the Poisson, you have the particle due to the thermal fluctuations never stays in the same, in the same line of flow. So it goes a little bit up, a little bit down some parts. And when this happens, when these parts go a little bit up or down, they are they are they phase up with a different velocity of the flow. So they are either uh, re well, delayed or advanced respect the, the main chain. And this uh, and this and the inertia makes that at some point it stays, then retracts and goes in this way. So it's due to the flow. So it's really it, it's due. To, I mean, this is due to the the different local velocity with the zeta direction. It was a in a steady flow, all independent, so all the values that will not happen. So that was a thing. Uh, I, mean, I mean, in the case of the magnetic brushes, mm -hmm. we know that this parabolic part is replaced by the Gens law. The Gens. So it seems to me that this Gens law is quite peculiar, right? Because it diverges at zero. No, well, but yeah, as mean, that, just the tail, you can adjust to the, excuse me, here. Just you can adjust the tail to this self-similar carpet profile. So this profile arises from when you have a surface and you have polymers that absorb on the surface and you want to compute the thinness of the, well, the density of at the several distance from the wall and what's used for that under certain assumptions. And you, the basic assumption is that uh, the difference between the parabolic profile and this profile is that in, the, in this case, what you assume is that the chains start to start one to the other, so that they are not kind of a, uh, so the blobs, let's say in that way, uh, one starts to, uh, to exert uh, an influence on the others. So. And well, it was kind of a, a surprise also for us that somehow you could fit it with the, the tail of the, of, the, of the density profiles with this of we're expecting some small variation with respect to the parabolic profile, but we'll see kind of a strong one. Okay, if there are no more questions, let us see the